together in the Word of God in our current series of Sunday morning studies in the Old Testament in the first book of Chronicles, chapter 29, and we read from verse 10 to the end of the chapter for this, our closing study in First Chronicles. First Chronicles, chapter 29, beginning to read at verse 10. <coughs> All the, all the preparation for the building of the house of God had been made, and we read in verse 10, <clears throat> Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed art thou, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, for ever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from thee, and thou rulest over all. In thy hand are power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank thee, our God, and praise thy glorious name. <clears throat> but who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from thee and of thine own have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners as our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building thee a house for thy holy name comes from thy hand and is all thine own. I know, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen thy people who are present here, offering freely and joyously to thee. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and such thoughts in the hearts of thy people, and direct their hearts toward thee. Grant to Solomon, my son, that with a whole heart he may keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord, and did obeisance to the king. And they performed sacrifices to the Lord, and on the next day offered burnt offerings to the Lord, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs, with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness. And they made Solomon the son of David king the second time, and they anointed him as prince for the Lord and Zadok, as priest. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father, and he prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. All the leaders and the mighty men and also all the sons of King David pledged their allegiance to King Solomon. And the Lord gave Solomon great <coughs> repute in the sight of all Israel and bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. Thus David the son of Jesse reigned <coughs> over all Israel. The time that he reigned over Israel was forty years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and thirty-three years in Jerusalem. Notice how there is recognition of how long they served. Then he died in a good old age, full of days, riches, and honor, and Solomon his son reigned in his stead. Now the acts of King David from first to last are written in the chronicles of Samuel the seer, and in the chronicles of Nathan the prophet, and in the chronicles of Gad the seer. 
with accounts of all his rule and his might and of the circumstances that came upon him and upon Israel and upon all the kingdoms of the countries. And so the story ends. And we say amen. And may God bless to our hearts such a reading of his word. Now in the providence of God, and it wasn't planned, we come this morning to the last in our series of studies in the first book of Chronicles. And in the course of this week, while preparing the, 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 the letter, the minister's letter that will eventually go out with the annual accounts of the congregation, I found myself thinking back to the end of the sermon last Sunday morning and to certain passages of Scripture that we did not have time to look up and to read. And the context, of course, was then, as it is now, David's provision for the building of the house of God, which work was to be done by Solomon his And in chapter 29, from which we read earlier in the service, in the second verse, we found David saying, I have provided for the house of my God so far as I was able. The new translation said, I have provided for the house of my God with all my strength or with all my might. And then when we move down to verse 5 of that chapter, we've, at the end of the verse we find David saying, Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? And David, the leader of the people, called to the people, called upon the people to give thanks, to bring their offerings, and to bring themselves. And of course in all the area of offering and service it is very very important that we should begin by giving ourselves to the Lord. And this of course is the New Testament pattern as we find it uh, expressed, for example, in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8, and the first five verses. I will read them to you. He says, We want you to know, brethren, about the grace of God which has been shown in the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of liberality on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. That is, they, they gave what strictly they weren't able to give. There was a real sacrificial element in it. They gave, as I testify, beyond their means of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. And I'm very aware, perhaps on an occasion like this, when we have spoken publicly of three of our elders, how true this is of so many here, not only elders but others, who have not only given themselves to the Lord, who have not only served the Lord, you have given yourselves to me as God's appointed leader of the work, and for this I am immensely grateful. The debt that I owe to those who have supported me is beyond all calculation. And I acknowledge it publicly. And I believe with all my heart that my debt to many of you will be gloriously manifest on the great day when we all stand before the Lord. This ministry could not have been without the prayers and the support and the love of those who gave themselves 
so willingly and so sacrificially to the Lord, to his service, and to his minister. And then in in this chapter in Chronicles, verse 29, chapter 29, as we look at verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, we see there that the people responded to David's call for dedication, and they did so, verse 9, with a whole heart. They offered freely to the Lord. And the passage above all that I wanted to refer you to last Sunday morning, and there wasn't time to do it, was a passage that makes, that makes me chuckle and always makes congregational treasurers chuckle when they read it. Because it's found in the book of Exodus chapter 36, beginning at verse 2. It is the story of the provision for the building of the tabernacle, that, that tent of witness and gathering that the children of Israel had in their long journeys through the desert. In Exodus chapter 36 at verse 2 we read this. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every able man in whose mind the Lord had put ability, every one whose heart stirred him up to come to do the work. And they received from Moses all the free will offering which the people of Israel had brought for doing the work in the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning, so that all the able men who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task that he was doing, and said to Moses, The people bring much more than enough for doing the work which the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave command and the word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let neither man nor woman do anything more for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. Now, in contemporary terms, that, that the equivalent is for the minister to say to the congregation, Now, I beg of you, for the next few Sundays, please don't put anything into the collection. Because the abundance of what was given was an embarrassment. It was more than enough. But my dear people, you know and I know and I speak only about our own denomination, for it is not right of me to speak of other denominations. The Church of Scotland in our land in the 1980s is nowhere near, nowhere near reaching the stage where there is even enough money to maintain the present work, let alone extend it. You hear, I'm sure, in Life and Work and in magazine and various other places that there's a significant lack of ministers and a significant lack of suitable people coming forward for the ministry. And, of course, we express concern about that. But behind the scenes there are those who say, well, in in a sense, we're really quite glad that there are not more people coming forward for the ministry And we are quite glad that there's not more people coming forward to serve on the mission field because we don't have the money to pay them. Doesn't that make you feel sad about this historic church of ours in this dear land of Scotland? And it makes us aware of the fact that what we were speaking about this last evening in the prayer meeting What we need is a renewing or a reviving or an awakening or or a quickening of the people of God who are in the church at the moment so that with a new recognition of all that God has done for them, they will give themselves first of all and then give sacrificially out of what they have so that the work of God's glorious gospel might prosper and extend to the uttermost ends of the earth. Now this story that we're reading in First Chronicles chapter 29 and expounding it in this way was recorded by the chronicler to encourage 
and to urge on the children of Israel who had returned to their own land and to their own city of Jerusalem after 70 years of exile in the land of Babylon. They faced a huge task and they were aware of it. They faced a great many difficulties and oppositions and they were aware of that. And in a situation like that, it is very easy to be demoralized. And so the chronicler takes this selected story of King David and his work and his preparation for the building of the temple. And the chronicler says to them and to us, see what they did in the past. Recognize in a new way what can be done with God's blessing when the people are willing. See what has been done. See what can be done. Now go to it. Oh, you say, preacher, we're beginning to see the significance of Chronicles. Yes. I see the significance of Chronicles far more clearly than I did at the beginning of this series of Sunday morning studies. But those who know their Bibles, and there are many of us who don't know our Bibles the way that we should, but those who know their Bibles will be able to recall from the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah that the experience and the attitudes of the returned exiles were not all that they should have been. They started well, and then they seemed to lose both vision and motivation, and they had to be challenged by God's prophets. And these prophets had to preach some very unpopular sermons. Preachers often have to. And I took time in the course of preparation to turn to the sermons of two, perhaps, of these prophets. And away over towards the end of the Old Testament, you come to the prophet Haggai. And in the first chapter of Haggai, at the second verse, we hear part of the sermon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people say the time has not come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses while this house, the house of God, lies in ruins? Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat but you never have enough. You drink but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put them into our bag with holes. Oh, you say, yes, it's, it's inflation. No, it's not inflation. It's unfaithfulness to God. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may appear in my glory, says the Lord. Look, said the prophet, consider your dedication to your own houses and families and compare that with your dedication to God's house. And God's work. And I turned over then to the very last book of the Old Testament, to the book of Malachi. And I read there in chapter 3 at verse 8. Oh, this must have been a very unpopular sermon. Will a man rob God? Oh, you say, surely not. Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing thee, O God? And God replied, in your tithes and your offerings. 
Verse 10, bring the full tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. Every time I read that verse, I think of the welcome social to me as the new minister way back in 1956 when Evelyn Sloan, representing the women's organizations of the congregation, at the end of her speech said, And my prayer for the ministry just beginning is that God will open the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing that there will not be room enough to contain it. And my heart just warmed within me and something in me said, Oh, yes, God, please do it. But you see, the abundance of God's blessing, I materially and spiritually, is related to and dependent on the reality, both materially and spiritually, of our commitment to God. Is it not very, very easy to let our own human interests and our own human expectations take first place in our lives. But our Lord Jesus Christ said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be added to you. But I believe that it is only as we see and recognize the greatness of God and the generosity of God in his grace toward us that we begin to give ourselves to him. And so in the last section and the last lesson that we are learning from Chronicles, we have in the passage that we read earlier in the service from verse 10 down to the end, A word from God to his people at a time of change, especially looking to the future. And in verses 10 to 13, and some of you will say, Oh yes, this is the passage you said last Sunday was too difficult to preach on. Well, I say it this Sunday again. This passage is far too great and far too profound to preach a sermon on. But in these verses 10 to 13 of our chapter, we have David's worship. This this was really the basis on which he led his people, the basis of worship. I suppose we could describe these verses 10 to 13 as a marvelous doxology. And we'll see in our study in Romans tonight several of Paul's great doxologies. And we'll say it tonight, but we can say it again. It used, it used to be a good fashion or practice in the church, especially the evangelical church, that on a whole variety of occasions, people would sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But you know, we don't sing doxologies nowadays, do we? Maybe it's my fault. I should maybe make you sing doxologies more often. Maybe at the end of a communion service, instead of singing a hymn, we should simply stand and the minister should say, Now let us sing the doxology without giving the introductory words because we should know it. Praise God from whom all blessing flows. And I can't help feeling, (coughs) and others would feel the same, other ministers feel the same, that to a great extent, even in the evangelical church, we have forgotten the essentials of worship. And the essential, the heart of worship, is to give glory to God. Oh, you say, preacher, we're we're ordinary folk. We don't know how to give glory to God. 
Well, get a Bible marker and put it in at First Chronicles 29 and from the t- time to time in your own home when you're all alone. Sit down and open your Bible and read these verses 10, 11, 12 and 13 of First Chronicles chapter 29. That's giving glory to God. Re- read it through and at the end, oh, you, 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 might, you might be feeling very spiritual and say, Amen, Hallelujah. On the other hand, you may use very ordinary language and read through these verses. Well, do you know, God, it's true. That's worship. To give glory to God. To declare not just his wonderful works, but the marvel of his person. And we don't think about him nearly enough. We, need, we need, need to go to various parts of Scripture, not least the very first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning, God. And God spoke, and it was done. The God of peace, the God of hope. Do you, do you ever take time just to think about God? We, we take time, don't we, to think about some of our friends. And some of you, sometime in conversation with me, speaking perhaps of someone, you say, oh he's, oh, he's a marvelous person. Do you ever talk like that about God? Isn't there a children's hymn that speaks about God who, who paints the wayside flower? One of the things that thrilled me at the Garden Festival was, was the house where I could go and see the butterflies. Oh, the colours. And the, and the perfection of the pattern. What a, what an artist. What a, what a God. The God who so loved the world that he gave away his only son. For the likes of you and me. What a God. This is worship. Not just to to declare his wonderful works. But to ponder and to declare the marvel of his person. And to realize that with a God like this. How does the hymn describe him? Most sure in all his ways. Oh, I'm glad I've got a God like that. I can be such an uncertain character at time, at times and get my thinking so confused and get terribly uncertain about some of my decisions. Oh, what it means to have behind you and round about you a God most sure in all his ways. The God, the God to whom belongs all might and majesty and power and endless praise. You know, with a God like that, we we have a right to rejoice. And we have a right to lay hold upon the future. And then we move on to verses 14 to 19. And following David's worship, we see David's prayer. And it begins with joy at the people's dedication. Oh, I can understand that. Isn't it one of the little epistles of John in the New Testament that one of the Johns says, Oh, I have no greater joy than this, that my children walk in the truth. That's David's heart here. He sees that his people are giving themselves willingly to their God. And his prayer begins with joy at his people's dedication. And the prayer goes on to express a recognition that all that they and we have and can do is the gift of God's grace. My dear people, do you ever wonder why God is so good to us as a congregation? Do you ever think 
some of the old members of Sandyford, who th- can think back a lot of years to times when things were not as they are just now. Oh, I can, I can understand their feeling when, when a lady well into her eighties says to me, Oh, Mr. Philip, isn't it lovely to see so many young people in church? Do you ever wonder why God is so good to us as a congregation? Yes, as David recognizes in his prayer, we are strangers and pilgrims. Here we have no continuing city. There's there's nothing certain. But God is with us. And David goes on in his prayer at verse 18. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of thy people and direct their hearts toward thee. O God, said David, don't don't let the people think too much about me and don't let them think too much about Solomon O oh God, direct their hearts to Thee. Keep their hearts fixed upon God and upon His purposes. And then in verse 19, Oh, I hope we are not intruding here because it's the prayer of a father for a well-loved son. A prayer that should move the heart of every parent. Grant to Solomon, my son, that with a whole heart he may keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, performing all, and that he may build the place or the palace for which I have made provision. Oh, said David the father, praying for his son Solomon, oh, God, help him to be wholehearted in his obedience and wholehearted in his commitment to service. But of course, we cannot pray that concerning our children unless we ourselves are willing to be the same. We cannot really pray honestly that our children will be more spiritual and more committed to God than ourselves. Because our influence and our pattern of life will have had a very significant effect on them as they have grown up from childhood through adolescence to maturity. And this is something we've seen too much of in the Church of Scotland. Parents sending their children. Oh, oh, they say, oh, Mr. Flip, we, we want our children to be taught. Parents sending their children to Sunday school and to youth organizations, but not bringing their children to church. And then when the children grow up, they abandon the church. Ah, but you say, Mr. Philip, we did bring our children to church. Yes, I know. There are other reasons and other influences that take our children away from church and from Christ. And many, many parents have heavy hearts. But I say this to you, pray on. Pray on believing. Pray on in faith, not in fear. Look for the day when your children will stand with you in Christ and in his church. We hurry to the end and simply point out that in verses 20 to 22 of our passage, we read read there of the people's dedication to God. Not their dedication to David, but their dedication to God. And they did so with gladness. And there is no doubt at all that when you have a congregation that is gladly committed to God, when they gather, there will be a spirit of worship 
and a spirit of grace and a spirit of praise and a sense of God's presence that will draw others to come. I turned up in my Bible this morning that verse in Zechariah chapter 8 verse 23 where the prophet speaks of a time coming when people from all sorts of places will say let us go with you because God is with you. That's witness. In verses 23 and 24 we read of the people's dedication. Their dedication or their commitment rather to their new king and to their new leader. And that really must have rejoiced David's heart. David abdicated. And Solomon was the king. Solomon was out front. David took a back seat. What a man he was. Takes grace to do that. And David's heart rejoiced. And Solomon was a different personality from David. He had a different work to do. But he was God's man for that time. And he deserved the commitment and the loyalty and the prayers of God's people. And Bill Dunlop likewise deserves that as I stand down and he takes this place for the next six weeks. I leave you with one last word in verse 25. The Lord gave Solomon great repute in the sight of all Israel and bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. Oh, you say, preacher, what are you going to say about that? It it speaks to my heart about God's faithful blessing. The God who has blessed us in the past, I believe, has every intention of blessing us in days to come. And that moves me very deeply. It encourages my heart and I hope it encourages you because it means because of God's faithful blessing that we can expect that the future will be greater than the past. I counsel you to think of that about your own Christian lives that the future will be greater than the past. I counsel you to think about your Christian service. I counsel you to think of this dear place upon which God has laid his hand and on which he has been pleased to pour out his blessing. Think, my dear people, as I think, Think of what God has planned for the years that lie ahead. And see to it that we are ready. Last Sunday morning after the benediction, as I came down from the pulpit and was walking up the center aisle to go to the door, I was very aware of what the organist was playing as a voluntary, as the, as the people left. It was the music of hymn number 509 that speaks of Jesus, Master, whose I am. And as I went up the aisle, the phrase of that hymn that was going through my mind and kindling my heart were these words. Open thou mine eyes to see all the work thou hast 
for me. And as I quote these words again this morning, I say to you the last two words that are written in capital letters on my sermon notes. Be ready. And by the grace of God, we will. Amen and may God bless to us the preaching of his word.